Uh, so good morning, ladies. I'm glad you're bla back. I'm glad to see your faces right before me and um, glad to discuss the third chapter, which is the most important chapter in this Bible study. And I asked you when you started out in week one, please stay with me through three weeks. Please stay with me through three weeks. And this is why. This chapter is about the essentials of having a friend you want to be. And it's his name, Jesus, and his relationship with you. So we're going to talk about how he never leaves us alone. Here's a nice little picture of friends swimming. And I want to know, has anybody ever heard from a mom or a coach never swim alone? Um, my mother used to tell me that we had a small pool in our backyard and we could never go out there by ourselves. We always had to be with somebody. In my own family, I was remembering a time when um, we were traveling uh, kind of late at night and we stopped at a hotel and it had a pool, which is everything to a car full of children, correct? But it was like 10.30, way too late for the pool, and so I promised them in the morning, which was like saying, tomorrow's Christmas, go to sleep. <laughs> so way too early, they woke up and they were putting on their swimsuits. My two oldest were on a youth swim team and they were ready to go down to the pool before I had my third child ready. And I said, you wait for me, you go down together, but you wait for me and I'm getting your sister ready and we'll come down. But before I could even get out the hotel door, up comes my oldest child tattling on my youngest child saying, mom, Amy's in the pool already and it looks weird. It's brown, I'm not going in. And so I quickly hurried to the pool of choice and did find that it was indeed very, very brown. It was um, the color of a soaked ashtray, I would say, around the edge of the pool, lots of hair ties and band-aids and cigarette butts. It's really special. And there was my daughter happily, happily, happily swimming underwater. Yeah, so uh, needless to say, we, we, we pulled her out of the water and called the housekeeping and they realized that the pump overnight had broken and it was spewing its contents into the water where they were steeping at 85 degrees, ready for us at the crack of dawn. Never swim alone. Today we're going to talk about water that's a little cleaner than that, living water, which is a reference to the fact that water is moving and activated and coming from a pure and continuously pure source. And we know, of course, that someone we know very well or are getting to know very well calls himself that very thing. He calls himself living water. We're going to do this study today by concentrating on this scripture, which is on your lap. Um, many of you, I hope, have a pen next to you. I know you moved from tables, but with a pen in hand, we are going to interact with the text. This is a, a technique of studying the Bible that I particularly like when I'm trying to not miss a point. Now, in this particular passage of the woman at the well, which you should have read through at least somewhat this week, I know you've heard it before, and I know you're not going to miss the point. But for the sake of study today, we're going to practice a technique which I think will even cement this even further. But before we do that, I want to talk about what we already know. We already know from our study that there are many levels of friendship. These are some, this is some language that I gave you in previous weeks that is language that I've concocted for the, for the sake of conversation. There are not just four levels of friendship. There are probably 14,000 levels of friendship. But for the sake of understanding, you classified some of your friends into categories so you could understand how is it that you're navigating them. At any one time, we say we have about 120, 130 people that are actively involved in our lives. Um, that 130 can change, or there can be a couple different pools of 130 or so, but those people we call acquaintances, we share a common sphere with them. Then we have our community with whom we share a common purpose. Some of you are here today in community sharing a common purpose. Then we have our companions with whom we have a lot more going on, usually a common passion. And our core friends are sometimes called our BFFs, which there aren't very many of because they take a lot of work. And we're a lot of work, and we share with them a common heart. But today we're going to center on the center of this ripple effect, who is the one that starts the pool in the right direction, starts the ripple in the right direction in the first place. And of course, his name is Jesus, and with him we share a common sphere. Um, I, I'm not accustomed to reading uh, to you, because you're grown-ups, but... Um, Water is such a big theme here, and there's so much in here, I really don't want you to miss it. If you had your Bibles before you, which I assume you do, but need, you needn't juggle with them just now, I'll tell you. If you looked back in chap John chapter 3, a famous chapter, John 3.16 is in there, 
we see Jesus talking to Nicodemus who came by night to get some information from him because his heart was unsettled with the status quo. He was a, um, a person learned in the Jewish faith, a Pharisee who should have had it all together. And somehow Jesus upset the peace that he had in his heart. And he went to, Nic he went to see Jesus at night and asked him some questions to which Jesus answered, you must be born again of the water and the spirit. To which Nicodemus answered, huh? What do you mean? How can a man who's born be born again? And what do you mean by that? But we see Jesus putting a, an idea out there about being born again of water and spirit. Following that, that piece, that up until about John 3, 17 or 20, we see references to John the Baptist. Not the John who wrote our text today, not John the disciple, but John the Baptist who preceded Jesus and was telling people, something's coming, something's coming, and here's how you're going to get ready. You're going to go to the water and get clean. So water, water, water is everywhere, and it's really convenient for me because this Bible study picked up a good theme, and Jesus followed my lead. Or maybe it was the other way around. <laughs> um, Jesus calls himself so many kinds of water in this very passage that we're going to see. So as you're looking at it, when you hear any reference to the word water, I'm going to invite you to put a squiggly line on or around or near. That, that goes for water and thirst and living water and well and spring and anything like that. So as you're listening, interact with your text and mark it with a squiggly line. There are times when Jesus makes a an invitational kind of question or provokes some kind of engagement and I'm going to ask you to put an envelope where you see that. Now this may be a little trickier for you to do while you're listening. You may need to go back and do that later which is perfectly fine. But as you're listening for Jesus, what he's saying or what he seems to be inviting, that's where an envelope would go. And then there are times when Jesus is specifically pointing out which is that which is true in the society he's in, which is that there's all kinds of divisions. That's true of the society that we are currently in, is it not? Have you seen the news lately? We are a society of them and us. Nothing new under the sun, said Solomon, the writer of Ecclesiastes. So when you see references to divisions among people, that which separates them or barriers or problems, I'm going to ask you to mark that spot with an X. And then when you see portions of scripture that seem to indicate there's a resolution or a response, this is where you put the check in the, a check mark, okay? There's a resolution or a response. All right, got your pens ready? Something to write on. I'm going to read to you, children. This is excerpted from chapter 4, verses 1 through 42, which is a little bit more complete, for the, but for the sake of brevity, I'm just leaving out a few verses. Starting with verse 4, Jesus says, we hear, Now Jesus had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and G Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone to town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, Give me this water so, so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you've had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. 
Sir, the woman said, I can see you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, replied Jesus, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you don't know, and we worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that the Messiah, called Christ, is coming, and when he comes, he'll explain everything to us. And then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Just then the disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman, but no one asked, what do you want or why are you talking with her? Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to town and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? And they came out of the town and made their way toward him. Meanwhile, the disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. And he looked at them and said, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, Did somebody bring him food? My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you have a saying, it's still four months until the harvest? I tell you, open your eyes. Look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. And many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him. Because of the woman's testimony, he told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. And they said to the woman, We no longer believe just on what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. At this point, I just want to go back to liturgy and say the word of the Lord, because it is, right? So much there. We're going to unpack it a little bit. We're going to look for these categories, and this is on your second sheet, on your worksheet itself. We're going to look for Jesus the friend who bridges gaps between people, meets people where they are, invites engagement, knows you well and loves you anyway, and is the friend you want to share. Let's get started. Jesus seems to encounter, I, I find that my, my slides are in a wrong order, but we'll go back here. Jesus um, is not afraid of the differences between people. Have you gotten that impression from him in other readings? Certainly in this one. Let's just talk about some of the gaps between people that we're seeing here. First of all, he's in a Samaritan area, which they intended to go through and not stay in. They were moving from the place they wanted to be, were, to the place they wanted to be, and had to go through the place they planned on not staying. But here's Jesus at the well in Samaria, at a place where the Jews from the southern kingdom of Judah have animosity toward the former Israelites from the northern kingdom of Israel who have mixed with the locals and had a, a mishmash, a mix-up of religious beliefs, some of which you see outlined here. There's a lot of contention between the two. Of course, you've heard this parable of the Good Samaritan, which points out that contention between people. And there again, Jesus says, I don't care about the differences between people. I care about the same between people. And here we see Jesus not, even, not only bridging the gap between race, and religion that we've just talked about, but also bridging the gap of gender, which in this era is huge. Very, very big thing to bridge the gap of gender. Now here's a woman alone, and a man is approaching her and speaking to her, to her and not only speaking to her, but inviting her into somewhat of a, um, an intimate moment of sharing a cup of water, likely the same cup of water 
This is going to be very shocking to an onlooker, you and me and the people of the time, even more shocking to them than to us, but uh, shocking to the woman at, as well. And you can see that she, in this position, feels a little uniquely vulnerable. But Je Jesus bridges the gap of gender right off the bat. And then he bridges the gap of her isolation. This gal is, for some reason, which we don't know for sure, we've just done a study here at church that says don't speculate more than the text allows, but we know that she is, al she is alone at the well in the middle of the day, which is not the traditional time for women to be gathering water. Needless to say, water is needed right off the bat at the first of the morning. Who's going to make the coffee? Water at the beginning of the day and women fetching it is not just a practical event, it is a social event, a community event, and it would have occurred on a daily basis. But here in this episode of this woman's life on this day, she is alone by herself at the well, vulnerable, a woman without other women friends gathering water. It's a curious situation. Jesus jumps right over the problem. And we don't know why she has five failed marriages. We know that she does have five failed marriages. Historically, we know it's possible that she was divorced because someone decided to be divorced with her from her based on the fact that she wasn't able to bear heirs or other whim. But at this point, Jesus meets her. We know there's a barrier of class going on here. She is a person outside the standard class of person that you might want to be visiting with. She is a divorced woman now living with someone who is not her husband. And we know that historically, without a man, it would have been very difficult for her to survive in that society. A Gregorian uh, society, a society that physical work was necessary, a division of labor of that sort. So it could be for this reason that she has settled to be with a man who is not her husband. But none of this, race, class, religion, culture, uh, gender bias, prohibits Jesus from an encounter with her. In fact, it's the place he begins with her the common place he begins with her is the place he moves from. He uses common things to help bring out uncommon truths. And that brings us to point two. Jesus meets us where we are. I love the way Jesus does not uh, expect you to go to church to find him in this parable. In fact, not this parable, in this, in this uh, account biblical, true biblical account. He's going out into the community, he's moving on his way, and wherever he is, is where there is an opportunity to make himself known. So he's always used metaphors and parables and analogies and stories, but also real life situations to teach challenging thoughts. So it makes perfect sense that while you're at the well, you might reference yourself as living water or the spring of water or a, a deep well. This makes perfect sense because it's visible to us right in front of us and now we can understand from the concrete the more abstract. He's done it all along. He does it with water and wine. He does it with wheat. He does it with parables of farmers and kings and tax collectors. He uses what is known to teach what is unknown. If you have small children, you've done this. I'm a small child when it comes to these hard things of Jesus. And in this case, so is the Samaritan woman. Because while he's explaining these things, she's still a bit confused. She's saying to him, what, what can this possibly mean that we're together? But in this provocation of confusion that he brought in with the invitational kinds of questions, she stands her ground and asks more. So when he um, invites us to engage with him, she takes him up on the offer. He says something to her in her mind that clicks, this prophetic piece about I know who you are, and then he fills in the gaps for her, and something in her changes at that moment. And she begins to ask him more questions. And she says things like, okay, I see you've got something going here, so okay, I got another question for you. You know, the worship place. The, pro, the, the mountain where we've been or the city where you are? What do, what do you think? What's the answer to that one? And he says, I'm going to tell you it's not about either thing. It's not about a physical place. It's about a place in the heart. And true worshipers have the kingdom of heaven in their heart. In essence, she, he's saying to her, you want to know where to worship? 
I am he. And he's in close proximity to the woman who is ready at some level to receive it. He invites her to engage. I appreciate that he can take my questions because when I came to Christ, I had way more questions than answers. In fact, I wasn't even sure what I was doing, okay? I, I signed up for it. I said, okay, I'm ready to listen and learn, but here's a few things I want to know about. That was 30 years ago. My list is three times as long now because the more I know, the more I know I don't know. Jesus is good for it. He proved it to her. She couldn't knock him off his game or upset him or get rebuffed because she was insolent. He welcomed the question and he answered her in the way she could understand at the time. And she was able to receive it because Jesus made this first thing true for her. In my company, you're okay. There you are with all your stuff, it's okay. And so the first thing he did for her was make her feel safe in his company so that they could continue the essential conversations of clarifying what it means to be a child of the living God. Jesus knows you well and me well and loves me anyway too. I tell my kids, there's no such thing as a secret um, politicians will tell you that now too, thanks to Instagram and Twitter and other digital manners, but it's always been true. There's never been a secret. And Jesus reveals that here. But he's not shocked. Did, have you ever read the Old Testament? Full of stuff. All the same stuff. Common to man, temptation and failure and sin stuff. It's all there already. You're not going to shock Jesus by what's true about you. It may be shocking for you to know he knows it already, though. I sense that was true for the women at the well, and it unnerves me a bit as well. But she understood that she was in the presence of someone special, not someone who wanted to tell her secrets around town or put them in a tabloid or, or fast-forward them on Facebook or Instagram, but somebody who was interested in her from where she was to where he hoped that she would be. But I wonder how many of us, when we find out something sort of unlovely about someone, either because they shared it intentionally or became known to us, do what Jesus did, which is step in rather than step away. The challenge is to recognize with grace and mercy, I got stuff, you got stuff. We can move through that stuff together. Now, those intimate revelations aren't for every friendship, but they are for this friendship. And there's no time ever that you can't tell Jesus the absolute truth. But it's clear here in the scripture, you don't need to tell him the truth because he doesn't know. You need to tell him the truth because he wants you to not go and get clean, but just come clean. So that's where you start. You start with clean water and you move toward the food that lasts. And then Jesus, of course, returned the favor. He came clean as well. He said, the one you're looking for, the Messiah, I'm he. I'm right here. And because of the way he addressed her at first, and the way he attended to her questions, and the way he understood her reality, and the way he did not condemn, and the way it tells us in Romans, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There wasn't. There's all have sinned and fall, fallen short of the glory of God. She did. I did. You do. I do. Right there, we saw clean and clear. It wasn't about what she did, but while, about the invitation he offered. And the one she was willing, even if uncertain about it, was willing to accept. And here's the deal. She didn't keep it to herself. She didn't keep it to herself. She went from an ostracized woman who seemingly had no community 
and maybe no standing with the people in her village, least of all the men in her village. And she read headlong into the population, leaving her water jar behind, because that had no value compared to the value that she just received. She didn't need that water. She had received living water. And she took that living water message to her community. And she said, come see someone who saw me and said it was OK. He knows. He could be the Messiah. Come see. And her witness was so compelling that right then and there, they dropped what they were doing and followed her back to the well, where Jesus is now having a separate conversation with his disciples who are kind of missing it. Here's how you know they missed it. You know where they went to get food? Right in the same village. How many people came back asking about Jesus because they had just circulated among the village? And here's the woman, the least likely evangelist you can imagine, full of scorn, full of history, full of bad reputation, we assume, a woman, at least, running into the village where they're coming out after her because her witness is that strong for someone who is that worth hearing about. And Jesus turns from his disciple conversation and looks at those people coming along and says, the fields are ripe for harvest. Out these doors, in our homes, on the highways, in our workplace, in our extended families. The field is ripe for harvest. And we have a message that's too good to keep in a jar. And Jesus is the friend you want to share. This week I got um, a special delivery of, of, of an invitation. I had a couple, three invitations. One was to a, a stodgy uh, business event. One was to a breast cancer awareness fundraiser. And one looked like this. And for those of you who um, aren't seeing this on video, I'm going to describe this. This is a, like a five by seven by, I don't know, two inch box in my mail with calligraphy some kind of special ink listing my name, stamps I'd never seen before because they're custom made, a seal with the name of two people on it that closed the box. And so when I brought this in the stack with the Bed Bath & Beyond coupons and the water bill, <laughs> what do you think I opened first? <laughs> this is an enticing invitation. This is the woman at the well. This is an enticing, exciting, vibrant, curiosity-provoking invitation. And you know what's even better about it? It's water-themed. <laughs> Can you see? Inside is a starfish. And an awesome explanation of an upcoming wedding of two friends in March in Florida on a golden beach next to rolling waters in a nice hotel where there's a room prepared in advance for me. Isn't God good? He uses the common things to teach uncommon truths. Sometimes he delivers them right to your door. You can't miss them. I'm probably going to go to this. <laughs> <laughs> and do you feel a metaphor afloat? Do you see that Jesus has invited us to a place where living water rolls next to golden sand with rooms prepared in advance for us at the great wedding feast of the Lamb? That's where he wants us to be, and he's not making any secret of it. So as we finish today, I want you to hear that you're not required to come worthy to Christ, but you are invited to come as you are. He's already worthy. 
And I hope you know that you don't have to inch up the circles of friendship to get in the center with him, eventually doing the right religious or behavioral things to get close. Because like the woman at the well, he crossed all those barriers, brought her straight in. That's his invitation for us. And I hope you can see that um, he's sending this invitation to meet me and you where we are, wherever this is, in our life, in our head, in our season, in our process, uh, uh, with, with a decision, with a desire to get us to the next place, whatever it takes, whatever provocation or questions or enticements it takes. Because it's he who knows us best and loves us anyway. It doesn't make sense. That's what you call unconditional love. And he's the friend I want to have and the one I want to be like. And he's definitely the friend I'm hoping I'm sharing with you. Because no matter what's going on in your groups as far as your friendships or what information you're taking out, because I promise you in chapters 5 through 8, you're going to have all kinds of technique and you're going to take it out. But if you don't get this, I've failed. I've failed to say, come and see the one who says, there you are and it's okay and I want to take you with me to where you need to be. I know that's not easy to say. In fact, it's a little easier for me to say in the spotlight with the speaker on video than it is out and about because that's what you expect from me here. It's way more difficult to do on the way, but that's how Jesus did it, on the way. Not behind a podium, not at a church or a temple, not with a crowd, but one-on-one. -on -one. And I think if we are listening and watching and taking care to see who's in our presence at any given time and what their common need is. Is it for water? Is it for a trip? Is it for a vacation? Is it for resources for a problem they're having? We have a small opportunity to meet them where they are. But we have to be ready to finish off with a big invitation. Maybe not in the first conversation. Sometimes in the first conversation though. This time in the first conversation. Nicodemus, it took him longer. At, after John 3, we see him again all the way at the end of John. And you know what he's doing? He's taking Jesus' dead body and wrapping it in cloths and anointing it with oil. It took him a while. We got there. So I'm going to pray now. And I'm going to um, ask you that if this is a time when you want to put a check, like you did on your on your um, biblical reading where there was a response made or an action taken. If, if you want to put a check where there was formally a question mark, this is the day to do that. And if you've already done that and you need to put, put some more living water behind that well which is trickling or the filter is broken and you're not spewing out that beautiful, clean, pure essence to those around you, this is the day to do that. But I ask you, if that's true for you, especially if it's the first time, don't let it be a secret. There may be an assumption that in this room we already already get this. Um, I think it's a wrong assumption. It took me a long time in church before I heard this for the first time, even though it was probably said many times. It took a time when my heart was ready, when I understood Jesus would accept me where I am and wanted to take me where he was and I could live in the question marks in between until he revealed them to me over time. So if this is the day for that, I ask you to make a check mark in your heart and if, if, it, if it's something you wanna do, tell somebody, preferably sooner rather than later. Tell your group leader or just put your name on a little scrap of paper with a check mark on it. She'll, knows what it, she'll know what it means. And there's not gonna be any roster or tally, it's, it's just so. You make the next step confirmed. Bow with me in prayer. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you initiate a relationship with me, with us. I don't know why I come to you with lots of agendas and expectations and sin, and back issues, baggage, mistakes, and misunderstandings, and yet you say, 
if you only knew who is in front of you, you would accept the living water. And Lord, I want to accept your living water today. I want it to purify the way water did for John the Baptist. I want it to give me new birth the way we understand it, it understood it for Nicodemus. And I just, I want it to quench my everlasting thirst. I agree, Lord, that you're the only way to get this right. I say yes to the invitation, even if I don't understand fully how this will play out. And I ask you, Lord, to give me the courage to take the next step tomorrow or today or this morning and to tell someone that I've decided that you are the way and the truth and the life. Lord Jesus, I fall at your feet. You are the only one worthy. And thank you for seeing me as I am and loving me anyway. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.